So good morning. Good morning, everyone. Love to see both familiar faces and new faces popping in. Well, welcome to today's program and welcome to our special guest, writer folklorist Jenna Rose Nethercott, the author of the enchanting novel Thistlefoot. This program is co-sponsored by Otis Israel in Washington, D.C. and Congregation Bethel in Bethesda, Maryland. We're grateful for the longstanding support of the Otis Israel Sisterhood, the Women of Bethel, the Library Committee, and the Men's Club. I'm Robin Jacobson, the librarian at Otis Israel. I also co-facilitate Bethel's book club together with Marge London, who's here today too. Because Thistlefoot is partly set in Ukrainian shtetl, uh, Marge and I, of course, had to have old world shtetl Zoom backgrounds. So you can see my cottage behind me and you'll see Marge's shtetl home in a moment. Before Marge introduces Jenna Rose, let me flag two upcoming community library programs, literary programs, both on Sunday, May 7th, one for adults and one for children and families. The adult May 7th program is at Bethel at 10 a.m. Dr. Miriam Isaacs will be presenting a famous treasure trove of Yiddish songs. You can choose either to attend in person or to stream the program. The children's book program on May 7th is for third to sixth graders and accompanying grown-ups. It features um, DC author Pamela Ehrenberg. This program is in person only at 12.30 p.m. in the Otis Israel parking lot tent. And you can read more about both programs in the chat. And now Marge will introduce Jenna Rose, but let me bring Marge on screen. So hang on, just a minute. Okay, I'm in. Okay, good morning. I'm delighted to introduce you to Jenna Rose Nethercott, who is joining us today from her home in Battleboro, Vermont. Jenna Rose's novel, Thistlefoot, was a finalist for the 2023 Jewish Fiction Award and one of NPR's and the Wall Street Journal's best books of the year. She is also the author of Lumberjack and Dove, a book length poem in the form of a folktale that was a winner of the 2017 National Poetry Series. She has traveled nationally and internationally performing both of her books, sometimes using a hand crank shadow puppet show. As befits an artist, Janet Rose's childhood and young adult years showed creative flair. Born and raised in Vermont, Jenna Rose spent summers touring with her father and brother in a family clown show. After graduating from Hampshire College in Massachusetts, where she studied writing, theater, and folklore, she spent five years living as a street poet, writing poems to order on an antique typewriter, first in Europe, and then in New Orleans. She later founded the Traveling Poetry Emporium, a team of poets for hire for events of all kind. Jenna Rose has been a writer in residence at the legendary Shakespeare and Company Bookstore in Paris, the Vermont Studio Center, and Art Farm Nebraska, among others. She is a researcher and writer for the award-winning podcast, Love, which presents true life scary stories. In writing Thistlefoot, Jenna Rose turned to her own family history in a small Jewish shtetl in what is now Ukraine. We'll hear about that later. In more recent family history, her mother, Helen, grew up in Potomac, going to Har Shalom and living next to longtime Bethel congregants. Helen Ribb and her family. Jenna Rose's grandfather, Saul, is a resident of Ring House in Rockville. So this is a homecoming of sorts. We are thrilled to claim Jenna Rose as a native daughter of Maryland, or at least a native daughter once removed. Now, for some program details. 
while Jenna Rose and Robin talk about this output, you are welcome to reserve a place in line to ask a question yourself. You can do this by raising your electronic hand and we will turn to your question toward the end of the program during the Q&A period. The portion of the program will not be recorded, so no need to feel shy. To raise your electronic hand, click on the button labeled Reactions, then choose the option Raise Hand. If you haven't already read Thistlefoot or you want to give a wonderful gift, you can purchase it from independent DC bookseller Politics and Prose in the chat. And now I'm going to turn the program over to Robin and Jenna Rose. So I'm here and let's bring on Jenna Rose. Okay, so, so welcome, Jenna Thank Rose. Thank you so much. This is so exciting. We are so thrilled that you've come to talk to us about Thistlefoot. So, it's so glad to be here. Yeah, thank you. And hello, everybody. It's just such a fantastically rich book about storytelling, about the way the past affects the present, um, and so much more. What a tour de force. And only a synagogue group would say this to you, but call Huckabode and muzzle tough on the book's success. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's so wonderful to see how many people have turned up to, to listen today. So thank you all for taking time out of your day to be here. It's our pleasure. So I thought we would start by maybe you would just tell us, give us a brief overview of Thistlefoot. What is the book about? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, this is Thistlefoot. I, I made it with my brain. And uh, Thistlefoot is the story of two contemporary Jewish American siblings, Isaac and Bellatine Yaga. Now they're both in their early to mid 20s. And they've been estranged since they were young teenagers. They're very, very different, the two of them. Isaac is a street performer and a little bit of a con man. And his sister, Bellatine, is a woodworker. She's really practical. The two of them really couldn't be more different. <clears throat> but one day, they receive news that they are going to receive a mysterious inheritance. And curiosity gets the best of them. So they decide to meet up and see what this inheritance is. All that they know about it is that it has come to America from Russia, from uh, what was, or well, from Ukraine, what was Russia when their family was living there generations before. Uh, and it had belonged to a twice great grandmother who they had never met and who lived in a small shtetl in uh, the early 1900s. So they meet up. They open this giant crate and they are amazed to discover that what this inheritance is, isn't any sort of typical heirloom. It isn't money, it isn't land, but it is a sentient house lofted up on a pair of chicken legs. And uh, it turns out that their twice great grandmother is Baba Yaga, the figure from Eastern European and Slavic folklore. And uh, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar. Oh, we have a special guest. This is Vivian. <laughs> She's just, she'll be around. <laughs> um, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the folklore of Baba Yaga or Baba Yaga. Um, but in Slavic folklore, she is this sort of crone witch figure who lives in the forest in a house on chicken legs. And um yeah, turns out she's Isaac and Bellatine's twice great grandmother, and they've inherited this house. So the book follows Isaac and Bellatine as they journey across America in this house, performing a puppet show. Uh, unbeknownst to them, they're being tracked by a figure who has followed the house across the ocean and perhaps across time. And meanwhile, we slip into the past and we spend time with Baba Yaga, who in, well, what I like to sort of say uh, jokingly, but also sincerely, is Baba Yaga in the traditional folklore, she is not Jewish. But um, in my version, she is a Jewish mother living in a shtetl in 1919. And I like to say that I just stole her for the Jews. So that's, you're welcome. She's ours. <laughs> we appreciate and, it. Yeah. So it, we, we follow her life in the past. We follow the sibling's life in the present. And then slowly we see how the two enter mingle 
So that's a, a wonderful overview. Maybe would you like to read us a, a passage from your book? That would be a treat. Sure, yeah. So when I say read, one of the things about this book is I um, I love touring. I love being on book tours. So, you know, Isaac and Bellatine in the story, they are puppeteers. And I couldn't let them have all the fun. So I decided I was going to start a puppet show. Uh, and so I've been traveling all over America with this puppet show where I perform segments of the book with puppets animating it. And while I don't have the puppet show here today, um, it does mean I have all the passages in my brain. So I'm going to pretend to read, but I'm actually going to be reciting it. <laughs> but uh, that way I can even read better. right in the eye. Even better. Um, yeah, so the the moments that we dip into the past and we see Baba Yaga and her family are told by the house itself. The house is the narrator, and they're told in the form of a folktale. So I'm just going to share with you one of those folktales. Have you heard the story of Baba Yaga and her two daughters? No? Well, she made them out of teeth. Listen. In the shtetl Gerenkrovka lived a woman named Baba Yaga, and she resided in a house on chicken legs. All autumn, Baba Yaga watches the Goyish and neighbor girls playing in the creek bed. She studies the way that they hold earthworms between thumb and forefinger, gently so as not to crush them. She studies the odd proportions of a girl. The way a girl's hair darkens when wet with stream water. The bright hunger in a girl's eyes. She takes careful notes in a cat skin notebook. She cultivates a yearning that roots in her own body, sturdy as an apple tree. This yearning is so thick and so sticky that it replaces the crone's need for water, for food. She teases out this loneliness, and she stirs it up in a wooden bowl with flour and honey and butter, and she rolls out the dough. This dough she cuts into little diamonds, and she rolls these into crescents. The following morning, she puts it in the oven, and when it comes out, Baba Yaga has rugula. She approaches the neighbor girls playing in the creek, and she offers them these pastries that she made. And the girls accept, eagerly. But when the girls bite into the rugula, the loneliness inside is so sticky and so thick that the girls' teeth catch in the syrup, and it will not come free. They gnaw. And they tug and they grind their jaws, but nothing will loosen them. Then Baba Yaga reaches forward, takes hold of the rugelach lodged in each girl's mouth, and yanks. Pop! Out come two teeth, one from each of the two young girls. Baba Yaga scurries home as quickly as she can. She wraps each tooth in wool. When night falls, she holds a bundle to each breast, and she nurses them. By morning, Baba Yaga has two young daughters. Her eldest daughter, Ela, is very smart and very cruel, and Baba Yaga loves her more than life. Her youngest, Malka, is only an infant, and she weeps all day and all night, and Baba Yaga loves her more than the moon, more than death, more than she could ever speak aloud in mortal words. One night, a soothsayer comes to Baba Yaga's door, and he tells her that one of her daughters will not live to see womanhood. And so, Baba Yaga slits the soothsayer's throat, and she cooks him in a big pot on the wood-burning stove, and that night, Baba Yaga and her daughters have a feast. The crone and her children nestle together, wrapping themselves in sheepskins, and they sleep. 
for a while, they are happy. Thank you. That bravo. That was such a treat. I love that. Teeth and rugula. Teeth and rugula. You gotta watch out. Can't I'm, take just any rugula. You can't just take any rugula. <laughs> Let that be a lesson to you all. So I, I'm wondering <laughs> after hearing that, you know, I know you you love folklore. You 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 are folklore. What what draws you to it and and how did you originally get interested? That's a great question. Um, so I think I've always been drawn to folklore, but when I really discovered or kind of like pinpointed my passion for it, I was in college. I was at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland and I was studying supernatural folklore ethnology. So specifically the studying folklore in an anthropological way. So the, the social and psychological functions of folklore. So, you know, basically in short, like why we tell the stories that we tell and how they serve us in our communities. And, you know, as a writer, there's something really appealing to me about this idea that a story isn't just entertainment, but it's an essential tool for us to be able to function uh, as a people. And specifically the kinds of folklore I'm most drawn to, and Thistlefoot definitely borrows very largely from this tradition, are folk tales where they seem like these fantastical, almost whimsical, magical stories. But if you strip back the veneer of the magic, there's something very human and often very dark hiding underneath. So essentially, folk tales and supernatural folk tales specifically are ways in which people can discuss things that are either too taboo or too difficult to discuss directly. And so instead of the suffering that comes with looking something dead in the eye, we drape this fantasy over it that allows us to talk about the emotions inherent in those painful things, but without kind of re-traumatizing ourselves. Um, and so that's what I'm really fascinated by, by not what folk tales say about magic, but what they say about people. That's so fascinating. That's so, and it comes across in your book. Um, an extra attraction for me in reading Thistlefoot and maybe other people too, is that the uh, original Baba Yaga is part of Ukrainian culture. And today, tragically, Ukraine is so much in the news. So I was wondering, were you still writing Thistlefoot when the war in Ukraine began? And I also wondered whether at any of your book events, have any um, Ukrainians come and reminisced about Baba Yaga folktales, growing up with Baba Yaga folktales? Yeah, she, like... The, I was not still writing the book when the war reached this fever pitch, which was really intense um, and also sort of strange and fascinating for me because the whole process of me writing Thistlefoot, I was, I was writing about, uh, you know, in Thistlefoot, it features a pogrom. So, and it's a pogrom specifically taking place in what is now Ukraine. So it's a story about a massacre against uh, you know, perpetrated by the Russian government against people in Ukraine. And I was studying it as this piece of history, right? And I was using it as a metaphor for the present. It's, you know, it's basically an anti-fascist fable. Um, so I, I was thinking of it as a, as a metaphor and kind of exploration of present political climates, but not specifically regarding Ukraine, more regarding American political landscapes. And uh, but and thinking very much of this event that took place in Russia slash Ukraine as something in the past that could represent something that was happening in the present. But then, of course, when the war escalated in Ukraine, it was this realization that like, oh, this is it's happening right now. And I realized I kind of uh, didn't listen to the lesson of my own book which the book itself is very much about, you know, the the way that the past is always occurring in the present. Um, and sort of the old adage of those who forget history are doomed to repeat it. And in thinking about this event as something in the past, I was neglecting to recognize the fact that it was happening very actively in the present. Um, as for events, yeah, I, I have had 
uh, people of various Slavic backgrounds, because Baba Yaga, she's Ukrainian, but she's also, she, you know, Baba Yaga stories exist all over the Slavic regions. Um, and there are many variants of her across the, that region. So there are, have been a number of people who've come up to me uh, after shows and shared with me that they grew up with stories of Baba Yaga or even given me like little gifts of like Baba Yaga books and Baba Yaga necklaces. And uh, yeah, she's become this really amazing connectivity figure between me and people all over the world. I really appreciated learning something about her. I just knew her name and that she mm -hmm. was the character. So you have enriched me with that. Well, and to be fair, the Baba Yaga in my book is very much my spin on Baba yes. Yaga. Um, and uh, traditionally, people call her Baba Yaga. I know, that, I know that the correct pronunciation is Baba Yaga, but to me, it feels like saying croissant instead of croissant. <laughs> so I'm just not going to do it. But, um, you know, I think that part of the way that folklore functions, which is another thing I'm fascinated about when it comes to folklore, is how these figures do adapt and change based on each new setting and each new teller. And so while my Baba Yaga is inspired by the Baba Yagas of yore, she's very much a new version. And to me, that's not like a violation of any prior Baba Yaga. It's a next link in that same chain of the folklore continuing to evolve. So there's something really exciting about being one link in a very long chain or like one pearl on a strand in the legacy of Baba Yaga. Yeah, that is wonderful. You're really honoring the tradition by continuing it and adapting it. So in, in writing Thistlefoot, you drew from your own family history. What is that history? Yeah, so um, hi to my Zeta, who's there out there right now, and hi to my mom and my dad, who are there right now. My dad has nothing to do with this. He's Irish, but hi to my mom. <laughs> Sorry, dad. Um, and uh, the so the narrative that we follow in the book, uh, Isaac and Bellatine are slowly learning as they go along, and uh, they are learning the story of Baba Yaga, their twice great grandmother, in this shtetl in 1919, in the months leading up to a pogrom. And the town in the book is called Gerenkrovka. There is no such shtetl as Gerenkrovka. Um, however, Gerenkrovka is directly based on a shtetl called Rochmistrivka, which is where my Babi's family came from. So her parents immigrated from Rochmistrivka. Uh, in the 19 teens. And it was, of course, in response to the pogroms that were taking place in the area. And the pogrom that takes place in Gerenkrovka is the exact pogrom that took place in Rochmistrivka. So I was actually able to find a firsthand account from, I believe, the rabbi at the time in Rochmistrivka describing essentially blow for blow what happened in this pogrom in May of 1919. And that is the basis with which I started Thistlefoot. So it's, uh, my family history is, they they were from there, they're from Rochnestrivka, my great, my twice great grandmother, um, or no, my, my great grandmother, yeah, my great grandmother, Golda, she and her fiance, they were teenagers at the time, their parents put them on a ship, were like, hey, good luck out there, go to America, live a better life, we're never going to see you again, sent them to America, and they never saw their parents again. Um, and here I am today, uh, born and bred Vermonter. So yeah, so what was really fascinating about the process of writing from that legacy is that I didn't know that much about that history when I started this story. I only knew in very light terms that like my family came to escape the pogroms. They were from a shtetl somewhere in Russia. And that was about it. Um, the protagonists in the book, Isaac and Bellatine, they are in a very similar situation. They don't really know much about where they came from. Now, an essential part of their journey in the story is learning where they came from. But in order for them to do that, I had to know where they came from 
So I had to learn where I came from. And so the two of us in tandem, me and my characters, were learning this personal history uh, with each other in a way, which was this really kind of magical, lovely camaraderie that I had with these characters as we both were discovering moment by moment these shared histories. That really is is lovely that you were uh, finding out about yourself as they were. The Golda you mentioned, I think I saw somewhere your, your name for her. Is that right? I am. Yeah. So my uh, name, Jenna Rose, I'm Jenna with a G instead of with a J. And the G is for, for her. Yeah. Her name was Olga, Golda, maybe Gussie. She had a bunch of, she had a bunch of names, but uh, yeah. So the G is for her. It was maybe um, meant to be that you would someday tell her story. Mm -hmm. And actually something that's really lovely, uh, the puppet show that I do, it's it involves these scrolling panoramic paper cut images. Um, and the Baba Yaga in the paper cut images, the artist I worked with based her on photographs of Golda. Oh, so. that's wonderful. Oh. That's really wonderful. I yeah. love that. So Thistlefoot is so much fun, but it also addresses some serious topics. And one of them has to do with the roots of racial violence. You, you actually and remarkably take us inside the heads of very ordinary people who become violent because a sinister person is stoking up their anger and resentment and their fears. And so I, I was wondering, like behind the scenes of that, were you were you trying to understand how mob violence originates, how it happens? Was that were you curious? Yeah, absolutely. And it was important to me that it, I really wanted it to be a story about how racial violence and or any kind of uh, like genocidal tendency or fascist tendency, um, it's not monsters that are doing this it is people it is ordinary everyday people and anyone can be uh affected by propaganda and pulled into an act of violence that roots from uh from fear uh so yeah we we get to see these characters who are just ordinary people who are set upon by a charming and uh eloquent and handsome, uh, very convincing individual who seems like their friend. And, you know, those are the most dangerous leaders. Are these people not who are these monstrous, terrifying, scary looking people? It's the charming, eloquent, uh, convincing orators who make you feel like you might be in danger and someone's coming to get you and this person's on your side to protect you. Um, and we see that happening every day here in the U.S. We see it happening all over the world. You know, I was writing this book during the Trump administration. Uh, we see all of these rising fear-mongering techniques happening today. You know, we see all this legislation going on uh, against uh, trans youth. We see a lot of anti-LGBT uh, movements that are going on all around this idea of stoking fear that somehow people must be in danger rather than the fact that the people who are in danger are the, are the minority oppressed groups. So yeah, so it was a, that's really a huge heart of this book is it's it's a cautionary tale about how charming leaders use fear as a tool in order to gain power and then in order to essentially divide and conquer where the most vulnerable end up being the most in danger, which as Jews, we have experienced for thousands of years. Um, and I think it's really important that for Thistlefoot, yes, the characters are Jewish um, because this is my family history, but that principle applies to any uh, any oppressed group. Well, yeah, and it comes across so clearly in your book, especially the way you take us into their heads. And I, I could feel myself getting like fearful, like, um, you know, what if there's a danger to it was very, very, very powerful. So another serious topic that Thistlefoot addresses is generational trauma. Um, Isaac and Velatine discovered that their rather unusual traits 
might stem from a family trauma that's been shaping generations of their family. Could you talk about that and your interest in it? Yeah, so I think one of the big questions in Thistlefoot is how much of ourselves are ours and how much of ourselves are inherited from memories and stories that we never even heard, that we never even learned. Um, and that question of, yeah, both how, so Thistlefoot exists in our world, essentially, but with one key difference. Uh, it, it's marketed as a fantasy book. I very much think of it as magical realism, which to me, the difference is in, in Thistlefoot or in magical realism, it's our world, but with the volume knob turned up. And what I mean by that is everything functions the way it would function for us, but the emotional truths of the story have this logic volume turned up on it. Um, they become hyperbolic in a physical way. So for Thistlefoot, what that means is in the world of Thistlefoot, if a trauma occurs that is potent enough, it can physically alter the space, the buildings, or the bodies uh, where it, it has occurred. And so in this world, buildings can come alive if something painful enough has occurred there. Um, and so this idea of, of trauma and memory, not only living in the way that we behave and teach our children, but living physically in our bodies and physically in space is a, an overarching theme throughout. And yeah, and I don't really know the answers to the questions. I'm not really interested in answers to questions, honestly. I think questions are much more interesting. And the question of like, yeah, what is inherited? What of what of the choices we are making today are actually choices that have been made for us by by memories we our family never even told us about that is somehow just built into who we are? And how is that impacting our behavior and our connections and our relationships in the present? So who knows? <laughs> yeah, who knows? Yeah, and I love that description of magical realism about the volume knob being turned up. Yeah, I, I get really excited by this notion of, you know, the idea of, of realism, for example, or like the logic of the world we inhabit, right? Where you have human emotion, which can often feel very... Uh, dramatic right like our our emotions can be all consuming um and then however the world outside doesn't necessarily reflect that you know there's this term of pathetic fallacy which means when like in a book a character's in a sad mood and it starts to rain right we don't really see that in real life where the world outside reflects our internal landscape in magical realism you kind of mend that dissonance where the emotional landscape of your characters then physically manifests in their bodies and in the world. So for example, if a character in a book is heartbroken uh, in realism, nothing really happens to the outside world. In magical realism, their body might shatter into shards of glass. So to me, it's a genre that allows the external worlds where the characters live to match the internal landscapes of those characters, which just feels very, yeah, it feels very harmonious to me. Yes, yes, I can see that where the inside and the outside uh, mirror each other. So um, Thistlefoot is a story within a story, and there's a puppet show within the novel. I love the puppet show. How, how did you hit on the idea of incorporating puppetry into your story? I just love puppets. <laughs> mostly just like puppets I think they're fun um yeah and I, I wanted it to be a traveling theater story um at the time that I first conceived of the idea for Thistlefoot I was on tour with my first book The Lumberjack's Dove which is a book-length poem in the form of a folktale that you can read like a novel it's a story there it is dead ahead um and uh, so for that book, I was on the road for eight months straight. I converted the trunk of my Honda Fit, which if anyone knows Honda Fits, that's a, that a widow car. It's a tiny little car, but I'm only five foot two. So it was fine. I converted the trunk into a little camper and I was sleeping in the trunk of my car. I was also performing a puppet show that animated the Lumberjack's Dove. 
And I was driving around the entire country in a new city every two days for eight months. Um, and so, you know, the idea of Baba Yaga's hut kept coming to me because it was this home you didn't have to leave because it could come with you. It was very appealing to me. And um, and so when I was coming up with the idea of Thistlefoot, like it may seem like this really fantastical story, but it's quite autobiographical, not just in the family history, but in the lifestyle of the characters who are these traveling bards, essentially, because um, that's what I was doing. So, you know, in part, Isaac and Bellatine are puppeteers, because at the time I was writing it, I was traveling around the country with a puppet show. <laughs> so, you know, you write what you know. Right. Yeah. Also, that's... living in Vermont, somehow, like, I would say a third of the people I know are puppeteers. There's like an almost upsetting like puppet to human ratio in the state of Vermont. So. I never knew that, but that's thrilling. You're right. Yeah. That's really thrilling. <laughs> yeah, really thrilling. Yeah. I thought you might say something about like puppets. I don't know. Maybe they fit with magical realism that they're they're real, yeah. but they're they're not real. You know, they're it's kind of in the border place between living and not living something like that yeah that's so absolutely right in that like puppets do inhabit this liminal space in that they are you know in a way they're inanimate but they're also they do feel alive and sort of like cartoons like they're figurative like you can recognize them as beings um but also they're not hyper realistic so you can still project your imagination onto them they live in this in between space and um most folklore also exists in that in between space the liminal is a really large concept in folklore ethnology where there's a, a so there's this whole idea, this whole theory in, in folklore that I'm very into right now, which is um, basically the idea that what makes a monster are two contradictory things in one body. So um, I'll just do this spiel really quickly, but it's very, I nerd out about this a lot. There's this essay by Freud called The Uncanny. Now I tend to take Freud with a grain of salt because that guy's got a lot going on. But this particular essay is really fascinating. And he talks about how the difference between fantasy and horror is that fantasy is a fantastical thing happening in a fantastical world. It's, you know, dragons aren't monsters because they're supposed to be there. You know, they belong in that universe. Um, horror is a fantastical thing happening in our world. So Godzilla, for example, is a monster because Godzilla is not supposed to be in Tokyo, <laughs> right? So it's actually not the thing itself that causes fear. It's the juxtaposition between something in a context it shouldn't be in. And the same applies for monsters, but in their own bodies, where you have this chafing of like, a vampire is both alive and dead, and somehow those are in the same body. A werewolf is both animal and human, and somehow those are in the same body. And so it's that chafing feeling that makes us really uncomfortable. And puppets have that same thing, where puppets have that same, they're sort of alive and they're sort of inanimate. They're sort of in our world and they're sort of in the world of imagination. So I think that's why they often get, they often creep people out for one, and they also often get associated with kind of magic and almost the supernatural because they carry a lot of the same traits as the supernatural with that chafing and that contradiction within their forms. So that's, that's so my much. puppet spiel. Yeah, that was a wonderful puppet spiel. I love that. I love that. Um, so in addition to making uh, with puppets and folklore, in addition to making Baba Yaga Jewish, you also made use of uh, other Jewish folklore elements in your story. Uh, could you tell us about those? Mm -hmm. So um, the villain, for example, is inspired by a folk tale from this book, actually. This is called A Treasury yeah, of Jewish Folklore. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I- in the Goddess and Bethel Libraries. Yeah. For anyone who's so interested, just saying, um, yeah. Me being me, I was like, eh, I don't really care about the wise men or the holy men section. I'm going to skip right to the demons. That's my jam. So I went right to the demon section and I found this story that I was just like, that is very spooky about um, a woman who is, she wakes up 
And she looks out and the whole town's empty. And she's like, oh no, has everyone gone to Shoal and I, I overslept? Oh no. She runs out into the town and she sees, um, sorry, my cat's on the roof and she needs to come in. <laughs> That's our compromise. She's an indoor cat, but she's allowed to hang out on the roof. Um, yeah, we have to have a cat as part of a folklore discussion. Agreed. Yeah, she's here. She's listening. <laughs> um, so she sees this man standing in the square. He's the only person she sees. And she goes up to him and she's like, excuse me, um, you know, I, I'm so sorry, but like, did, is today a high holiday that I've forgotten and I've forgotten to go to Shul? And he's basically like, oh, let's go to the synagogue and, and find out. Like, here, let's let me get the door for you. And he reaches out to open the synagogue door. But teensy tiny problem, synagogue doors across the square and his arm goes all the way to the door. <laughs> And she's like, oh, no, you're not a man. You're a demon. Um, and I just I just think the idea of a man who's too long is very scary. <laughs> and so uh, I adapted this folktale to be the villain in Thistlefoot, where Isaac and Bellatine and the house, which they named Thistlefoot, is uh, they're being pursued by this figure called the Long Shadow Man. And sometimes he's just a little too long. Um, and so, you know, I, I took these moments from traditional folklore and, and turned them into characters that then interact with each other. There are moments as well where, uh, you, he, like Thistlefoot, the house, when Thistlefoot is narrating these folktale-esque stories about Baba Yaga, will talk about certain folk figures like the Ziz, which is a bird that's so big, its head is up in the sky and its feet touch the bottom of the ocean. Um, and as well as like different uh, Jewish demons. And the villain is also based on uh, Dybbuk folklore as well, uh, where there's this figure that crawls onto people's backs and clings onto them. And so, yeah, it was a, it's a taking this blend of sort of either secular or kind of sometimes Christian, but mostly secular Slavic folklore, uh, American folklore, American travel legends, like train hopping lore, and also Jewish folklore and stories, as well as just kind of my own personal mythos and blending them into this, this little melting pot of stories. More than a little melting pot, a wonderful- Big melting pot. pot. There's a lot of words in there. <laughs> wonderful. So let's maybe switch lanes a little bit because you mentioned your traveling bard lifestyle and your wonderfully adventurous writer life. And so I was curious with your interest in storytelling and language, you might have chosen a more conventional path. You could maybe have been an English teacher who wrote on the side, but instead you forged something very original and made it work, which was very brave and, and inspiring. And so I just wondered, like thinking back on that now, you know, now that you've built a life in this unique way, um, what what are your reflections? Hmm. I um when I was younger, I was much more practical. Um, I when I first went to college, I thought I was going to be an English teacher because I didn't think it was practical to do anything else, you know. And uh, so I started taking education classes, and I started taking poetry classes, and I was just so bored. I did all I wanted to do was write poetry. Um. And so I was like, eh, no. <laughs> and I also, you know, um, spite goes a long way for me. It's a very powerful fuel. And enough people said to me when I said I was studying poetry, like, huh, well, that sounds lucrative, um, that I just really had a strong fuck you energy brewing in my body that I, I wanted to make use of. And so I decided uh, just to spite the people who like laughed at me when I said I was going to be a poet, um, I was going to only be a poet. I was going to find a way to make a sustainable life around it. Um, so yeah, if anyone's looking for some motivation, just like try to get a, a little petty about it. And that can really go a long way. So, but basically I, when I was in college, I, I was writing a lot and then I would stop writing and find that I just felt insane. And when I realized like, oh, I need to be writing or I fall apart, I recognize like, okay, if, it, if that's going to be how it is, if I have no choice in the matter, <laughs> then I may as well go all in. And so that's what I did. I decided, you know, 
I've always been someone who I don't like being told what to do and I don't like uh, other people being in charge of me. I'm very stubborn. <laughs> and so I decided like I was going to find ways where I got to just do whatever I wanted to do and like people would deal with it. And so that's what I did. I started, uh, I literally would print out little Xerox chat books of my poetry and like hawk them on the street. I would set up with an old typewriter on the street and folks could come and give me any topic they wanted and I would compose a poem to order on the spot for them. I did that traveling all over Europe and all over the States and found that I was making enough money at it that I was able to quit all of my like crappy barista jobs and do that full time. And it was just sort of a slow process of, of like, collecting and collaging all these different like strange little tasks together until I was able to build a life out of it. Um, and yeah, not being afraid to fail at it either, I think was yeah. huge. And for me, I think I'm really grateful that I've never really had that fear. Like I, I kind of don't care if it goes badly. I know that I'll be okay and I'll pick it up and I'll do something else. So yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's wonderful. A combination yeah. of inspiration and general pettiness has yeah. brought me far in this <laughs> life. That is a good motivator. And yeah. It's about <laughs> as fear. well as like, yeah, about I, I really, it was important to me, not just for myself, not just to prove to myself, but like, we live in this really oppressive capitalist kind of hellscape <laughs> for so much of our lives. And we're told so often that there's only one way to be a person and that there's only one route that one can take in order to be a person. And it was important to me to prove not just to myself, but to my friends and to those around me that like there's other options. So I wanted to be a living example that there could be other options so that other people might recognize that they don't have to plug into that system in the same way. You're, you're a wonderful role model in that way. And if you hadn't done all those interesting things with all that energy, we wouldn't have Thistlefoot. That's so true. I, have, I know other people have questions they want to ask. So I'm just going to ask one more question for now. And I, I, I actually thought I would ask not you or not Vivian, but I, I understand you might have brought a special guest with you today. I certainly do. Oh, this is very exciting for me. Let me introduce you all to uh, my dear friend, Baba Yaga. Oh, Baba Yaga. This is such an honor and a pleasure. So I, I want to thank you for coming today with Jenna Rose. And I, I do have a question, if you'll do me the kindness of considering it. Um, I would like to ask, my question is about your last will and testament. And in, in your will, you left your house, Thistlefoot, to your youngest living descendants, 70 years after your death. So my question is, why the delay of 70 years? And also, you know, why did you leave the house to your youngest descendants? Maybe you could have left it to their parents who were closer to you on the family tree. So, so that's my question about your will, the 70 years. My will was left for distance. I wanted it far and I wanted it gone. I wanted me far and I wanted me gone. And if the house was to find anyone and ever leave getting Krofka again, it would be in a time when I was only dust on the wind. Seventy years felt long but short, and the youngest members are far enough from me, as a poppy is on the other side of this earth. I wish never to touch the home again, and so in that be forgotten while being remembered. Wow. Oh, thank you so much for that, Baba Yaga. And, and thanks to both of you for such an interesting and stimulating and enriching conversation. So now I, I know other people have questions and I am trying to find my page that tells me like what to tell you about asking. Well, questions. I see one on the uh, 
on the chat right. for a second. Okay. While you're looking, I'll answer that one. Okay, um, so you do that. Sure. So it's asking what my writing schedule is like um, from Beryl. Hi, Beryl. Um, and so when I was writing Thistlefoot, I really need a deadline or else I'll just never. I'm, I'm, I, I'm willy nilly about it. So uh, for Thistlefoot, I gave myself a really solid um, regimen where I would write 600 words a day, four days a week, which I'm an incredibly slow writer because I still write like a poet. So I tinker over every single tiny word before I move on to the next word. It can take me ages to write just one sentence because I'm tinkering and rearranging before I move on to the next sentence. I'm definitely not one of those writers that like spits out a draft and then goes back and heavily edits. Um, so 600 words, that's only about two and a half pages per day, which is not very much. Many fiction writers will write like a thousand, two thousand words easy in like an hour or something. That ain't me. Um, so yeah, I was writing 600 words a day, four times a week, or essentially trying to hit about 2,500 words per week. And so what I did is I had my, my little calendar, um, and on every Sunday, I had the word count written on the calendar where the word count should be for that week. Um, and that was, yeah, that was my regiment. Some days I would end up writing twice as much and then I could only, I only had to write three days that week. Um, but yeah, so that was basically my, my writing regimen. My writing schedule though, when I'm not on deadline is who is, I can kind of go months when I was writing primarily poetry, I would go like months without writing anything. And then I'd write like an entire book in six weeks. Um, so the the novel is a much more intensive process. So I had to regimen myself that way. But big, big proponent of incrementalism. The idea of being like, oh, I'm going to write a 450 page novel. That makes me want to die when I think about it. The idea of, oh, I'm going to sit down and write two and a half pages. That is incredibly fathomable. And turns out you can write an entire 450 page book in two and a half page increments. So for anyone who's interested in writing, I highly, highly recommend like very gentle incrementalism. Good advice generally for all kinds of projects. Yes, definitely.